Alright, so we didn't quite get through this message last time, so we're going to try it again. Um, we'll see how this goes, okay? So, uh, if you have a Bible, you turn to Galatians chapter 2. If you don't have a Bible, they're in the back, you can get one. If you got one on your phone, uh, I do not use that, but you can, as long as Scout's on or you don't uh, use it on Facebook. Twitter or Instagram, anything like that. Okay, so this message is called Free, Justified, and Changed. We're going to cover all of Galatians chapter 2. Alright, so point number one that you see on the screen is free by grace. Free by grace. Uh, this is the main takeaway we get from chapter 1, remember? Alright, so this is our takeaway. For number A, it says, remember, A, God's pleasure it's not, in you, it's not based on your performance for Him. God's pleasure in you is not based on your performance for Him. Alright? We need to get that through our heads. That sounds good. That sounds free. But it might be frustrating, right? Like, I, I should be able to please God. God save me. I should do things uh, that are for Him. So that cannot be frustrating for us as humans and frustrating to our pride. And no, actually, Paul says... That we're supposed to live a life that is pleasing to God. It says that in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9. Paul says his aim is to please God. And he tells Christians that they have the same purpose. But if God's pleasure in me is not based on my performance for him, then how can I please God? Right? How can I please God if it's not based on what I do? That's the question that we want to answer tonight. Because there is a way we can do that, but it's not based on the you know, us giving money, us going on mission trips, that's not going to earn us more favor before God, okay? You're not going to get to heaven one day and God's about, boy, your quiet time was one of the best I've ever seen, right? And because of that, you get a bigger mansion in heaven. It's not how it works. We don't earn favor by the things that we do, okay? And there are three pictures that we see in the church today, okay? So this is our second section that we'll be covering. This is the three pictures. And A, the first one is legalism. legalism. Legalism is right behavior with wrong belief. Right behavior with wrong belief. So I got a video I want to show you. Uh, I don't know where our media team is at tonight, so I'm going to try to do this and at the same time, but uh, this is a good video, I think, in regards to uh, legalism, and I know my wife will really appreciate it, okay? So let's check this out. As you can see, I have provided everything any child might need. But clearly we need to set some rules. Rule number one, you will not touch anything. Uh, what about the floor? Yes, you may touch the floor. What about the air? Yes, you may touch the air. What about this? Ah! Where did you get that? Andy. Okay, rule number two, you will not bother me while I'm working. Rule number three, you will not cry, or whine, or laugh, or giggle, or sneeze, or bark, or fart. So, no, no, no annoying sounds, right? Does this count as annoying? How many of you guys have seen, uh, seen these people me? That's like Candace's all time. Favorite movie? Can somebody write us up a favorite movie? Yeah. Okay, that's an all time favorite movie. And I think that's a really good uh, example of legalism because how <coughs> are girls supposed to obey these rules, right? You can't, you can't make annoying, annoying noises, you can't fart. Like, you guys got younger siblings, they do those kind of things, right? So, it's, yeah, exactly. And legalism is rampant in the church in a lot of areas, and it's right behavior with wrong belief, all right? So we're going to read Galatians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, okay? It says this, all right? They're there, Galatians chapter 2, starting in verse 1. Then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along with me. I went up because of a revelation set for them the privately for uh, those who seem influential, the gospel that I proclaimed among the Gentiles in order to make sure I was not running or had not run in vain. But even Titus, who was with me, was not forced to be circumcised, though he was a Greek. 
yet because a false brother secretly brought in who slipped in to spy out our freedom that we have in Christ Jesus so that they uh, might bring us into slavery. To them we did not yield a submission even for a moment so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. From those who seem to influential, what they were makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality. Those I say who seem to be added nothing to me. On the contrary, when they saw that I had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been entrusted with the gospel to the circumcised, for he, had, uh, for he who worked through Peter for his apostolic ministry to be circumcised worked also for me for my Gentiles. And when James and Cephas and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived that grace was given to me, they gave me the right hand of fellowship to Barnabas and me, that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the, uh, to the circumcised. Only they asked us to render the poor the very thing I was eager to do. Okay? So the disciples, or the apostles, were those guys hanging out with Jesus when he was alive, right? Did Paul hang out with Jesus when he was alive? No, no. He, he encountered Jesus after Jesus ascended to heaven after the resurrection, right? So a lot of people question Paul as an apostle. An apostle means somebody who has it's a special office in the church. So apostles wrote scripture. Those are people who wrote scripture, just like prophets in the Old Testament wrote scripture. And like we talked about last uh, two weeks ago, which we made snow last week, uh, circumcision was a required law in uh, Judaism. And the Jews were saying, in order to be a Christian, you got to be circumcised and you got to believe in Jesus. So they're saying Jesus plus something else. And Paul is saying that's not the gospel. The gospel is faith in Jesus. And so while these uh, Jewish scholars, Jewish priests, thought these things, uh, with right intentions, they had right behavior with wrong belief, right? So these Judaizers were promoting good things, they were saying uh, supposedly good things for right behavior, and they had wrong belief. The Old Testament law was given in important to Jewish life. So like the Old Testament, the Jews had to be circumcised. That was part of the law. And that was a good thing for Jews. God doesn't give us anything that's bad for us. He doesn't give us anything that we don't need. The Old Testament laws are part of God. They're part of the Bible. And in and of themselves, they're good, not bad. But laws become legalistic when added to the belief that by doing them, performing these acts, we can earn favor before God. And so maybe that's not an issue for us today uh, in that sense, but legalism can be an issue for us, right? So we think that maybe we are closer to God, and we're having a quiet time, we're studying the Bible, we're avoiding certain sins, we're coming to youth group, we're coming to be now, we're helping other people, and then we're closer to God than other people because we've done more good things. And so we have more faith. You have a job, right? If you have a job and you put in a lot of extra work and you do a lot, you're going to be noticed by your boss. You might get a promotion, you might get a raise. It doesn't work that way with God. We have already been justified, something that we'll talk about a little bit later. So all these things are very good, like doing a quiet time to the Bible. Those are good. But when we do them with a the mindset of earning God's favor, we become legalists, right? So if you do a quiet time because you think you have to do one in order for God to love you, you're not doing it with the right intentions, right? If you go to help somebody, because you really don't want to help somebody, and the only reason you're helping somebody is out of your own selfish gain, that's not legalism. We help people because we have the Holy Spirit inside of us. And because God has loved us, we love others. That's the whole point of 1 John 4, right? That God loved us first. So because God has loved us, we will love other people. Okay, B, the second example is hypocrisy. All right, the second example is hypocrisy. What's it? Let's make a note of Rachel? Rachel? So if somebody says one thing, they do the other. So yeah, I've got it right here. Hypocrisy, right belief with wrong behavior. So let's check out verses 11 through 14, okay? But when Cephas, Cephas is Peter, so remember that. When it says Cephas, we're talking about Peter. But when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face. That's some good trash talk. Because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles, and when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. Those are the Jews. And the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him. And so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that their conduct was not a step of the truth of the gospel, I said to see was for them all. If you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like the Jews? Right? So how many of you have ever heard, hey, you can't judge me, right? You heard somebody say that. Uh, I wonder if those people realize that God, the one, will judge everybody. Those are people are typically, typically hypocrites, right? So they're doing something that's contrary to the Christian life. And they're saying, hey, you can't judge me. You know, I said I'm a Christian. And I'm doing things that Christians wouldn't do. You 
can't judge them. Well, the reason we know, for example, that we do have the right to call out our brothers and sisters is because Paul called out Peter. So a little background. I told you guys a little bit about this last week. Uh, Peter, in Acts chapter 10, gets this vision. And he's supposed to go see this guy named Cornelius. Or Cornelius gets a vision. And so he goes on his way to see him. Now, back in the Old Testament, Jews did not eat with Gentiles. First of all, Jews and Gentiles just didn't really get along. But Jews had specific dietary laws. You go back and read all these laws, like you can eat this bird and this bird, but you can't eat this bird. You cannot eat shellfish, but you can't eat this. You can wear these certain clothes, but you can't mix patterns. There's a lot of rules. And these rules were good for Israel because it protected them. They ate certain foods and not get sick. They considered these foods unclean. Well, the Gentiles didn't observe the law, so they <coughs> ate whatever they wanted to eat, right? Like, if you guys had a choice to eat whatever you wanted to eat, would you, would you eat a lot of maybe like vegetables? No, Candace, I make you eat vegetables. Right? She even has to put like a little something in it to make you eat one of them, right? So she's like, I'll cook some steak if you get like a piece of vegetables too, right? Well, Gentiles are do what, Rachel? Okay, that's your opinion. Right? I don't like vegetables necessarily. Okay, okay, I'll give you that. So the Jews would not even sit at the same table as the Gentiles. And the reason they did that is, is if they let them come sit at the table with them, they were saying, this is acceptable. They're acceptable before God, right? They didn't want people that they didn't think was acceptable before God to sit with them. And you guys, you may do the same thing as they, right? You don't eat lunch with people at school that you don't like, right? Or if there's somebody that it kind of smells kind of funny, right, and you don't really like that person, and nobody likes that person, you're not going to let them sit with you. Because what a parents does that give? Oh, oh, we're friends. Right? No, no, you can't sit beside me. We're hypocrites. And we're Christians, and we do that kind of thing, right? Absolutely. And the Jews uh, in the Old Testament, were, I mean, they were obeying God's law. But Peter meets Cornelius. Cornelius gets filled with the Holy Spirit. Cornelius gets baptized. Cornelius is a Christian. Peter experiences this. And Peter starts being okay with the Gentiles. Well, the Jews start getting on to Peter. And next thing you know, Peter, even though he's lived like a Gentile, he starts, uh, when the Jews, uh, the Gentiles leave, he goes to sit with the Jews. And all of a sudden, people are like, oh, Peter's doing this. So I'm going to do it too. So Barnabas gets led astray. You know, he is working with the disciples. He gets led astray. And he starts doing the same thing. And Paul's saying, you hypocrite. All right? You live, uh, you say one thing and you live a different one. You can't, you can't do that. And so Paul called out um, uh, uh, Peter right here and said that his conduct was contrary to the gospel. Verse 14 said, I saw their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel. So when somebody's conduct is not in step with the truth of the gospel, they're hypocrite. And we have the responsibility as Christians to call them out, right? Like if I, if I got on Instagram later and you posted just something really just outrageous and shit post, I'd probably call you and say, you're not going to take that thing, right? Like you were at church now, people know you're at church now, people know you're a Christian, and Christians don't do these types of things. We don't have fellowship with the darkness. And so that's something that I'm not saying to you. And that doesn't mean you can say, only God can judge me. That's not, that's not what that means. I can't. Because I, I, I care about you and I hold you accountable. Just like you should do the same thing with me if I do something that is not in line with the gospel, right? Peter knew and believed the gospel, but his actions did not reflect the gospel. So Paul called him out. And that shows that Christians can judge one another in that sense. So today, like I said, we're not really dealing with Jews and Gentiles eating together, but there's a lot in our lifestyles that can be in conflict with the gospel. We watch what we listen to, what we say, how we act, how we treat other people, what we do on social media, what we do on the internet in general. If, that's, if it does not glorify God, then we need to seriously question whether we should be doing these type of things, all right? If these things should be confronted, and that does not make us legalists, all right? So Galatians reminds us that we can easily drift towards legalism or hypocrisy. Uh, but there's one thing that can save us from both of that, and that is point C, faith. Faith is right belief with right behavior. Uh, here Paul describes uh, faith as just that, right belief with right behavior. So how do you bring Right behavior, right living together, it's all centered around faith. Our whole religion is centered around faith. Everything is centered around faith. And justification comes by faith alone. Like I said, we're talking justification just a little bit. So our third section is number three, faith alone. And in these verses, we see two largely important fruits or results of faith. So because of our faith, two things are going to happen. A, through faith in Christ, we are accepted before God. Through faith in Christ, we are accepted 
before God. Here's what verses 15 and 16 say. We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law. Because by works of the law, no one will be justified. So in these verses, Paul reminds Peter that they as Jews not to find salvation through the law. In the Old Testament, the law was given and Jews were expected to obey the law. So you guys familiar with the Ten Command tribes? Great right? show of hands if you've ever broken one of the Ten Commandments. Right, that is everybody in the room. Everybody's broken the Ten Commandments. Okay? Yeah. But like you've told a lie, right? You've been jealous of something. We're human, right? And that's just our nature is inclined to sin before we know Jesus. We're children of the dark, is what the Bible says. And so Jews can never fully obey the law, right? It's not like they were just like, all right, this guy right here, he hasn't sinned yet. He's eight years old. This is the guy. He's going to do it. No, we're never going to obey the law completely. If we can obey the law without sinning, then there's no need for Jesus. If we could go without life without sinning, then Jesus didn't have to die on the cross. But the point is that no human being, except for Jesus Christ, who is also fully God, has been able to do that. We're born with sin. Psalm 51, 5, we've talked about that a lot. None of us can attain righteousness on our own. So Paul reminds Peter of this, and he says that they should accept the Gentiles because they believe and they feel the Holy Spirit. And so that's, that, that's encouraging for us, right? Because we're Gentiles. So that means that we can be Christians. This is not just for the Jews. It's also uh, for that. And a couple of points with that is this. This is exactly what all this means. It's number one, that we are justified by faith. Justified by faith. Here's the definition for justification. Justification is the gracious act of God by which uh, God declares a sinner righteous solely through faith in Jesus Christ. Number one, we are, uh, we are justified by faith, right? The term justified appears four times in verses 14 through 16. This is something Martin Luther talked a lot about in church history. Uh, justification is very important to him. Even for John Calvin, John Calvin said that a justification is the hinge upon which everything turns. The whole Protestant Reformation. How many of you guys know the Protestant Reformation? Right? Martin Luther, I hit the door and nailed the 95 theses. Uh, that's made a little bit bigger than it actually was, but uh, he completely split, split from Catholicism. A like priest couldn't marry, next thing you know, his priest are getting married. I think he completely changed everything. But it's based on this. Catholics thought you could earn favor before God by one giving <coughs> money, which kind of sounds suspicious, right? If you ever see those TV preachers online, they're like, somebody here has headaches. You need to donate $157.38 and you won't have headaches. Well, everybody in this room has had a headache. But if you're watching and like, you, you really get headaches bad, you're like, he's talking to me. I'm going to give my money. God is not going to bless you more because you have given money. It doesn't work that way. We give money through tithing and people going on trips because God has given us so much. Do you have a question, Chris? I have a question about that. No, no. Why did you say, like, give up something? So, Lent, that's a really good question. Lent is, uh, I don't do Lent uh, because the Bible says when we fast, we're not we're supposed to do it in secret. So we're not supposed to be telling anybody that. Man, I'm giving Instagram up for 40 days. A lot of people do that. There's nothing wrong with that. They do that in anticipation for Easter. So they're kind of cleansing their soul. They're giving away something worldly. They're supposed to fast from food, really. Not eat meat, except for Friday, they can eat meat. Uh, they're supposed to eat meat. Uh, I don't know enough about the Catholic doctrine to answer that one. Uh, but they do that in anticipation for Easter. So when Easter comes, they're really focused on Easter. It's a good thing. But I think we should do it more than 46 days out of the year. I think we should do it the whole year. And I don't think we should tell anybody about it, right? It's a good question. It's a really good question. Because Lent is happening right now, okay? So here's what uh, Martin Luther said about, uh, uh, about uh, justification. And this is the truth of the gospel. It is also a principal article of all Christian doctrine, wherein the knowledge of all godliness consists. Well, it's necessary, it is therefore, that we should know this article well, teach it to ourselves, and beat it into their heads continually. Right? I try to beat things into your guys' heads continually all the time, right? Like, I'll repeat things, I say things a lot. Why? Because I want it to stick. I want you to understand this. I think it's important. And that's what Luther's saying. Is we need to beat this in their heads. That's pretty much what Paul is doing right here, okay? Number two, justification is the gracious work of God. Justification is the gracious work of God. 
So Paul is actually alluding to Psalm 143 here. Uh, verses 1 and 2 say this. Lord, hear my prayer. In your faithfulness, listen to my plea. And in your righteousness, answer me. Do not bring your servant into judgment, for no one alive is righteous in your sight. No one alive is righteous in your sight. So the psalmist is admitting that no one's righteous before God, nor is there anything in man that can make him right before God. Nothing in us causes God to save us, right? Like God does not look down and say, Man, Owen Hash is a really good football player. He's one of the NFL. And if he goes to tell about God, then everybody's going to become a Christian, right? Like people say that about Tim Tebow. I love Tim Tebow. I think he's great. Just because Tim Tebow's a Christian doesn't I mean a lot of people are going to become Christians. God does not need Tim Tebow to get the gospel out. God does not need us. He saves us for his glory. He saves us for his glory. So justification is all about grace, which means that faith is evidence of grace. So we need to be careful not to make faith into a work of law. But I think that we've done this by saying, if you pray this prayer, you'll be saved. So you have to pray this prayer in order to be saved. So how many of you guys have heard that before? If you just bow your head and pray this prayer, you'll be saved. I've heard it a thousand times. There's nothing inherently wrong with it. There's nothing inherently wrong with it. A lot of good people can say that way. A lot of people have been saved that way. Uh, I did it, and I wasn't saved. I, I, I thought I was. We need to be careful with those things. Okay? Praying a prayer will not save you. It will not earn you favor before God. Having a relationship with Jesus Christ is the only one. Okay? So number three, justification declares the sinner can be righteous. This is really good. I've got a good illustration, I think, for this one. Okay? So justification declares a sinner to be righteous. This is the gospel. So some people think the gospel is good advice, right? Like, man, I just think it's good advice. I'm like, oh, man, you can read your Bible. And the Bible does have some good advice in it, I would say. It's a holy and errant book. It's infallible. There's some good stuff in there. It's all good stuff. But the fact that we've been declared righteous when we are not is good news. Check this out. How many of you guys have uh, taken a test before? Class, right? Everybody. All right, so you see, this is good advice. You have a professor called and said, remember students, study for at least one hour every evening, memorize all the key terms, and complete the review report. And this, this test is going to be 40% of your final grade. All right? This is also good advice right here. The, the exam is today. It says, okay, students, just stay relaxed. Don't try to work quickly. Remember to trust your preparation instincts. All right? So you've studied, and then this happens right here. Oh no, it's happening. My mind's going blank. Think, 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 you fool. And then you, you don't want that, right? You're struggling. Well, this is it. I'm going to fail this exam and just fail this class. My life is up. How many of y'all have had a test before in your life? Oh, crap. I don't know any of these words. I don't know what this is saying. Uh, when I was a senior in college, I had this thing called senior itis. Have y'all ever heard of senior itis? It's pretty much when you're just ready to be done, right? I'd already been accepted to grad school. I was just kind of coasting. And I missed class the week before, for whatever reason. And I walk into class, and everybody, everybody's, when everybody's in class, that's not a good sign. Uh, it's really cool in here today. And I sat down, and the teacher said, all right, uh, put your stuff away. Uh, we passed the test out. I had no idea what they had test that day. And I sit there like, can I, can, I, can I be seated? Can I leave and make it up? And he saw me. I luckily made a B on it. But I felt like this right here. I was like, oh my gosh, I don't need this. But check this out. The teacher says, young man, you seem to be struggling quite a bit, clearly struggling. He says, why don't you scoot over, uh, scoot your chair over, and let me take this exam for <laughs> That's good news, right? Right? All right, so what kind of math class are you guys in? Excel, not that one. Not that one. Let's say, okay, has everybody in here been thinking of geometry or familiar with geometry? Let's say you're all in geometry. And then Candace walks in, she's your teacher, and she gives you a theoretical math test where most of the questions are letters and not even numbers. Uh, would you feel confident that you would pass it? Yes. No, yeah, you would not. But if she sat down and said, I'm going to take the test for you, that's good, isn't it? Right? If the teacher takes the test for you, pretty good chance you're going to make a pretty good grade on it. And that's what the gospel is, right? We have the law, we have the law, and we can't do it. We can't obey it. And Jesus says, let me do it for you. That's the gospel. Jesus says, you can't do it, but I can do it. And that is good news. That's not good advice. That's good news for us today. Okay? That is good news for us today. Now this declaration, declaration that God, uh, uh, the judge, makes involves a sinner. A guilty man standing before a holy God. This is a crucial point for Paul with justification. When Paul first encountered Christ, he realized that God's judgment was due him. 
Not just because of the bad things he had done, but even some of the good things he thought he did. Here's what Paul says in Philippians 3, 5 through 6. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, the blameless. Paul spent his entire life trying to obey the law, trying to be good. When he was persecuting and killing Christians, throwing them in jail, he thought he was doing good things. He was trying his best to keep God's commandments. He thought he was doing what was right. And when he met Jesus, Jesus, he realized something, something life-changing. He was not good. And my question, have you realized that, that you're not good? That really within you, before you meet Jesus Christ, you are, you're not a good person. You, you're evil. Well, the Bible says that we're born in nature's a brat. When we encounter Jesus, everything changes. His goodness saves us, all right? In verse 8, Paul said, Because of him, I have suffered the loss of all things that consider them filled. So Paul says, I, I lost everything because of Jesus. And it's all rubbish. I don't need it. I don't want it. So all of our self-made goodness is actually dirty and <clears throat> filthy in the sight of God. All these mission trips that we go on, all these good things that we do, it's, it's not good compared to Christ. It's, it is in the human world, it's good that we do these things. We need to do these things. But it does not give us a good favor for God. In justification, God takes the sinner, a guilty sinner, and declares him righteous. The holy judge of the universe takes a sinner who is willfully sinning in rebellion, deserving hell, deserving a guilty verdict, and he says, not guilty. He says, not guilty. Justification is the opposite of condemnation. It is God, once and for all, Forgiving sins and declaring we are righteous on His side. You're at peace with God. You're innocent. You're no longer guilty. And that's the gospel. God doesn't look down and say, look at that forgiven sinner. He looks down and says, look at that righteous human that has been given the righteousness of Jesus Christ. But how? Can we as sinners be declared righteous? Number four, justification is only through faith in Jesus Christ. So God the judge takes right the righteousness of Jesus Christ and credits it into your account. When you put your trust in Christ. So if I was like, hey, listen, I've used this analogy before. I, I won the lottery, and I, I want to keep this money in my bank account. So if I keep it in your bank account, then you can spend it whenever you want to. Now, you're okay with that? Right, yeah, absolutely. Right. You're getting credit for somebody else's, in that sense, luck, I guess. But if I say, oh, hey, my paycheck, I'm going to send it to your bank account. You can spend it if you want. But if somebody has asked, that's good, right? That you're getting something that you didn't earn. Something that you didn't deserve. That's what we get with Jesus. Paul says it like this. He made the one, Jesus, who did not know sin to be sin for us. So that we might become the righteousness of God in him. 2 Corinthians 5, 20. So remember, we're guilty. We deserve death. We deserve hell. But through faith in Jesus Christ, we are justified. And we are credited to Jesus. Who bore the wrath of God on the cross. And in turn, by his death on the cross, Christ made a way for righteousness to be for us. Uh, but this righteousness is not given to us of our own attempts to add to Christ's finished work. It's not Jesus plus something. We're made righteous. That, that misses the point. We are justified by trusting in Jesus. Not prayer, not baptism, not trusting Jesus in that. Not faith plus something else, but faith in Christ alone. So, uh, have you guys ever uh, heard of a Rolls Royce? It's a really, really nice car, right? There's an old story, I don't know if it's true or not, but this guy uh, buys one in Europe, buys a Rolls Royce, and he drives somewhere else, and the car breaks down. The Rolls Royce was, like, it was advertised as the perfect car. It will not break down. And the boy, it kind of expensive to fit, fix, it's an expensive car. So he calls the Rolls Royce uh, dealership up and says, hey, my car needs this part. Uh, the mechanic says, um, can you send it to me? And I'll pay for it. So they send the part, and he fixes Rolls Royce, and drives off. Well, like a month goes by, and he hasn't got a bill back. And he calls and says, listen, I haven't got my bill. I need to pay for it. And they look it up, and they say, sir, there's uh, no bill under your name. You don't owe us anything. That's the gospel. That's the gospel. That we have been giving something that we don't deserve. This is what happens when they believe the gospel. When you place your faith in Jesus and receive his forgiveness and righteousness, God looks at you and says, I have absolutely no record of anything ever having gone wrong. Good news. However, keep in mind, justification is not God sweeping sin under the rug and creating things that do not exist. Have you guys ever done that? Like, uh, like you're going to touch the cleaner room, you maybe stuff in the closet, hiding some things. 
Yeah. Or how many of you guys have dropped an ice cube and you just whoop, kick it in the fridge? Right? Does that ice cube go away? No, it's going to melt under the fridge. Luckily, I have a dog with those ice cubes, so I just give it to him. But I used to always do that. Just kick it under there. If I stay in my room and I see something like, uh, just throw it in his claws and I'll get it later, right? Well, that, those clothes are still there. That ice cube is still under the fridge. So we don't just sweep sinner. Sin still exists. Jesus does not just sweep it under the rug. God knows it exists. The sin has a penalty. And Jesus Christ paid that penalty. The records of your sin were put on the cross on God's Son. That's why we are accepted before God through faith in Jesus. And that sounds good. Um, and that, that's really good for us. That's how some people oppose the gospel. That's how the Judaizers opposed it. Opposed it. If faith alone in Christ Jesus is our only acceptance for God, does that not mean that we can live however we want? Uh, if we're going to be prepared for our sins, then I can live however I want to live. I can do whatever I want to do. That's a matter what the Bible says to sin. Jesus is going to forgive me. And Galatians 2 says that's not necessarily true. Okay? So B, through faith in Christ, we are alive to God. We are alive to God. We're getting towards the end, but there's seven things really shortly that this means. Okay? So in verse 18 and 19, Paul warns against trusting Jesus and then starting to live like he did before. So Paul is saying, you don't ask Jesus into your heart, and then you keep living in rebellion. You don't say, Jesus, come save me, and then keep sinning and thinking you're good. Your life is changing. <clears throat> if there has been no change in your life, have you been saved? In verse 19, Paul, said, tells, uh, Paul tells us why he died of the law. He gave it up so that I might live for God. So number one, this means we live by faith. Paul had no room for salvation that consisted of praying a prayer, supposedly trusting Jesus to live me a life that you wouldn't live. That's impossible. Faith is not just receiving salvation. It's enabling us to live out our salvation. Right? So, you know, I, a lot of people say, would you die for God? Here's my question for you. Will you live for God? Not would you die for God. Will you live for God? Will your life reflect the gospel? I hope it does. I really hope it does. Faith is not just receiving salvation. It's also for enabling us to live out salvation. We live every day, every moment by faith. And this is why Paul says this in verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul says it's not me who's living, it's Christ through me. Number two, we die to sin. We die to sin. Romans 6, 3, Paul says, we have been baptized in Christ's death, which means we died with Christ. So well, what does that mean? It means that we died of sin. We died of his penalty, his power, his dominion. All of our sin, past, present, and future, was paid for on the cross. You've been forgiven for every sin. It doesn't mean that you don't ask for forgiveness. But on the cross, Jesus paid for all of it. Christ took it all. Your justification is sealed. You've died of sin. God's declaration is final. When God declares you righteous and justified, done deal. You don't lose that. Number three, we die to ourselves. Paul says in verse 20, remember, he no longer lives. This is why salvation is more than just believing about God and saying a prayer. You don't just think in your mind of what Jesus was written about him. You place your faith in that. That You place your faith in what Christ did and you give yourself to it. Your heart of stone is crushed. Your pride is shattered. And your life is surrendered. You die to your old self that is dominated by sin. You don't care anymore what people Right? You give your life and you say, you give Jesus a blank check. And you say, I'll go wherever you want me to go, do whatever you want me to do, and I'll live it out. Number, uh, number four, he covers our sin. This is what happens when we die. He takes all our sin upon him and his blood covers it. Paul says Christ died for us while we were still sinners. So in the Old Testament, I told you guys this before, that John before the death of they killed this goat, the high priest throws the blood of the goat over the Ark of the Covenant. In the Ark of the Covenant is the Ten Commandments. I already asked you guys how many of y'all have broken some of the Ten Commandments if they raised their hand. So every year when God was going to judge Israel, if he looked at the Ten Commandments, every one of those was going to be broken. But because the blood of the Lamb was on top of that, he covered it. Something died in their place. Something died so they could live. Jesus died so that we can live. It's the same thing. Except for the Jesus' death they poured off. They had to kill this goat. They did this day to come. They did it every single year. Jesus didn't have to die again. Jesus died once and for all, and it covers, covers our sin. Number five, he changes our lives. But when Paul says that he's been crucified with Christ, he's basically saying, it's not the same me anymore. It's not the I that tried to work for God and failed every time. This life is no longer about me because Christ lives in me. So we live differently. 
If we know Christ, we live differently. Number six, we are not in debt to Christ. We are not in debt to Christ. And this might be contrary to how we normally think about faith. Right? If somebody does something tremendous for you, you owe them something, right? And Jesus, this is a pretty tremendous. He paid for our sins, so we're in debt to him, right? We reflect on what he did on the cross, and if we're not careful, we begin to say, what must I do now for Jesus? And the danger is Christ has not stopped doing anything for you. Christ is still working. You are not, and you cannot pay Jesus back. He is still paying for you. What is the key to the Christian life? Faith in Christ. Number seven. We have Christ in us. Christ in us. The Christ uh, Christian life is not so much about you and I living for Christ, and it is as it is trusting Christ to live for us and through us and in us, and that's faith. So the Christian life is not about us living for Christ, but it is us trusting in Christ to live for us and through us and in us. By faith we are accepted by God. <coughs> by faith we are alive to God because we are attached to Christ. Last section. Free through faith. So how do we please God? How do we do it? How can you obey all the radical commands of Christ that we see in the Gospels in the New Testament? And the answer is you can't. You can't do it. You need Christ. He's there. Trust Him. Realize God's pleasure in you is not based on your performance for Him. Instead, believe this. A, God's pleasure in you is based on Christ's performance for you. God's pleasure in you is based on Christ's performance for you. Remember, after we've been accepted by God, our good works are still a result of Christ's work in us. We have good works because we have Christ in us. We serve others because Christ served us. And because He loves us and we love Him, we love others. We must trust Him daily to produce in us uh, what uh, pleases God. But how do you know He will give you everything you need to follow His word? He loves you and He gave Himself for you. That's what Paul says in verse 20. He loves you and He gave Himself for you. You can trust Jesus to be everything you want in your life. That means two things. That's very different. Number one is passionate about you. Jesus Christ is passionate about you. He loves you. It's good to remember that God's passion is for the world and for all people. Christ died for all nations. That's biblical Christianity. But remember that Christ died for you as well. And He died so every people group on the earth will be around the throne of God. He died for you. No one is more passionate about you. No one loves you more than Jesus Christ loves you. I love Candace with all my heart. I will die for Candace. No questions asked. My love for her is not mention what Jesus has done for her. So because of that, if I really want to love Candace, I have to love God. Because I love God, I love my life. Right? And you might say, well, there's plenty of Christians who, uh, plenty of people who are not Christians who love their spouses. And I'm not going to argue against that. But they don't understand the true beauty of it. Because I love God. I know what God's done for me. I know how to serve my life. I'll do it perfectly. But that's why Paul says to be just about husbands. Love your wife as Christ loved the church. So how did Christ love the church? He died. He gave everything. So my responsibility to my wife is to give her everything. To, to be passionate about her. And I'll never be as passionate about her as Christ is for us. Number two, he has paid the price for you. He gave his life on the cross so that his life, with all of its present and eternal benefits, could be yours. So if you do not know Jesus Christ, do not leave here today without talking to you. Alright? We have a business meeting, but if you do not know Jesus, I really, really urge you to talk to me tonight about that. Uh, I love every one of you guys. I really want you to understand that. I love Galatians. There's so much in it. So we covered so much. And I know we covered it fast. There's a lot of truth in it. Okay? I'm going to pray. We've got one announcement. And then we'll be done. God, I thank you for this evening. I thank you for the truth of the gospel. I thank you that we are justified through faith alone, through Christ alone. Thank you for saving me. And I pray if any student in here cannot say 100% certainly that I'm a child of God, they'll talk to me. And maybe their life doesn't reflect it. Maybe they're in a rut. I don't know what it is. May they talk to me. In Christ's name, amen. All right.